the administration of President Muhammad Ubar came to power with a promise to fight corruption. An intrinsic part of that promise is getting back stolen money and assets which are overseas. That effort has uh, achieved limited success due partly to the fact that Nigeria does not have legal treaties and agreement with some of these countries where stolen money have been kept. But that looks set to change, or is it? We'll be taking a look at the subject on the program tonight, plus lots more. I am Shegun Ojumu. Welcome to Hindsight. On this program, we'll be bringing you news, views, and exclusive interviews with security that cut across humanitarian aid. To it becomes easier to do business in Nigeria. Now, Nigeria. The federal government this year alone has recorded some success in tracks in tracing cash allegedly stolen by former government officials. Cash worth several millions of dollars have been quite literally unearthed in different parts of the country. But there yet remains millions of dollars in Europe and the UAE, which are suspected to be proceeds of crimes. Soon after his return to Nigeria, President of Nigeria, Muhammadu Buhari, uh, his first task was the signing of the execution of nine instruments of international agreement between Nigeria and some of his foreign partners. Relevant sections of the 1999 Constitution, as amended, empower the President to perform the signing of instruments of ratification of certain agreements on behalf of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. Now, during the signing ceremony, President Buhari expressed the hope that the instrument signed will strengthen the anti corruption war and stem the flow of illicit funds out of the country. Here is this report by our State House correspondent, Kende Amudu. Four of the nine international agreements endorsed by President Buhari are between Nigeria and the United Arab Emirates, while five of the treaties are between Nigeria, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Libya, Niger, and the Republic of Chad. President Buhari sees this ceremony as an important milestone in efforts by Nigeria to demonstrate its sovereign capacity to fulfill her international obligations while attracting benefits in its foreign relations. Relevant government agencies have therefore been charged to ensure immediate implementation of all agreements ratified. All agencies of government with roles to play under the respective treaties now ratified are hereby directed to ensure that they play their anticipated roles in an effective and responsible role in an effective and responsible manner in order to ensure that we reap the full benefit of these agreements. Attorney General of the Federation says the signing of the treaties demonstrates the resolve of government to play its role as a responsible member of the international community. We shall continue to explore all possible avenues for cooperation and collaboration with different segments of the international community in a manner that promotes our national interest and promotes global peace. And this is exactly what this ceremony is intended to signify. Bilateral agreements between Nigeria and the UAE are on mutual legal assistance in criminal matters, mutual legal assistance in civil and commercial matters, as well as extradition treaty to facilitate the transfer of sentenced persons. Agreements ratified between Nigeria, Cameroon, Central African Republic, Libya, Niger, and the Republic of Chad under the charter of the Lake Chad Basin are the African Tax Administration Forum Agreement on Mutual Assistance in Tax Matters, the World Intellectual Property Organization Performances and Phonograms Treaty, World International Property Organization Treaty on Audiovisual Performances, as well as the Marrakesh Treaty to facilitate access to published works for persons who are blind, visually impaired, or otherwise. From State House Abuja. Joining me now to discuss the subject is our State House correspondent, Kendi Amodu. Kendi, thank you very much for coming on the show. Thank you. Okay, uh, we just heard your report there. Now, your, uh, the administration says this, these treaties, you know, uh, will invigorate, reinvigorate the war on corruption. Will it or will they? Well, to, to answer that question, 
you have to go to the background of uh, how these treaties came about. Okay. Um, when he came in as president, uh, there are a few countries that the president went to uh, in, the f in the Middle East. Yes. Uh, he went to the UAE, mm -hmm. he went to Qatar. You know mm -hmm. And these uh, countries he went to were to actually reach an agreement with governments of those countries concerning the nation's oil. Mm. Uh, um, because coming in, the, there was that realization that a lot of Nigeria's oil gets stolen on the high seas. Mm. Uh, and so the whole idea is to find out the oil uh, with Nigeria's signature, which is easy. You mm. know, they call it Nigeria's D uh, oil D DNA, DNA. Mm. which is easy so that we'll, you, you'll be able to trace where these uh, um, barrels of oil have gone. Mm. But the second part of that was to uh, get to sign uh, some of these treaties. Mm. And, and when he went there, um, he went with his representatives and ministers, mm. and they signed those mutual agreements. Now, what he's doing now is to uh, append his signature to the instruments that will make those uh, treaties effective, effective okay. in Nigerian space. Okay. And what he is targeting, of course, is um, business or uh, illicit funds Fund. mm. that have been taken out of the country to these countries. And uh, we hear that a lot of those illicit funds in the UAE, in okay. Dubai, in mm. Abu Dhabi, and that is the target. Mm. So yes, those treaties are supposed to invigorate or will invigorate the anti-corruption mm. Yeah, you kind of uh, took the my next question out of uh, my mouth because I was going to say, you know, the UAE, the UAE seems to be a country the, uh, the president is interested in and uh, that seems to suggest that uh, there are some illegal or illicit funds stashed in that country. You know, most of our attention used to be on, on Switzerland and some other Britain, US, but now attention has been shifted to UAE. Why is that? Well, there's a lot of um, investment in oil, in a, a lot of investment in real estate in those countries. Mm. And um, that's easy money to be made mm. from those countries. And of course, um, after looking, his um, security agencies and intelligence agencies would have looked at where these funds are. Mm. You know, and they will now want to go after those funds. So fun, funds that have been laundered, you mean? Uh, well, yeah, laundered. Dubai real estate over there in Dubai. Uh, but funds that have a name. Mm. Somebody laundered them. It came under somebody's name. Mm. Somebody took those funds. A lot mm. of those funds are taken by government officials mm. abroad. Mm. And so they have names. Mm. He's, he's not just doing it in UAE. He's done it in the UK. And right. he's done it in the US. And so... Uh, in the UK now, properties uh, that have been bought by Nigerians, uh, there's, there's a register now. There's a register. Right. You understand? Mm. That will identify those persons. Mm. And if, if the West is sincere or honest with those policies they have signed, our agreements they've signed, we should start seeing a lot of um, revelations. revelations like the recent revelations that came out of the U.S. Mm. Uh, concerning the former uh, minister. minister, I wouldn't mention whose name. Uh, <laughs> you know, yeah. those are issues you know that you start to see. You know, there was an anti-corruption summit in May last year mm. where Nigeria was represented, mm. the, uh, which was uh, set up by the U.K. government, yes. and these issues were discussed in detail mm. and countries reached an agreement to you know fight the, the to to not only fight the war against corruption by word of mouth but start putting their muscle behind it okay uh, some there are some who feel that the anti-corruption war has lost uh, steam do they have a point in your opinion well if you if you take it from the point of view that there hasn't been any major conviction you understand what I, what we've seen is uh, we've seen plea bargains. Mm. We've seen people return money behind the scenes, mm -hmm. but we've not seen 
And I think maybe, uh, uh, since we have to remember that the anti-corruption war predated this administration, we've been talking about anti-corruption since uh, about 2001 when uh, General or President o Obasanjo, uh, Obasanjo, Obasanjo yeah, was in power. It was in power. Yes. I say 2000 because he didn't immediately start talking about anti-corruption. Yes. But when he started talking about anti-corruption then, mm. about a, a year into his administration, mm. that is when you see him setting up EFCC, ICPC. Mm -hmm. Since those administrations came on board, has there been any major conviction? Mm. You can point to one or, or two, two under Mm. President of Basanjo. Yeah. Minister of Info uh, Education, Adenike Grange, or uh, one of them? No, no, no. Those were, those were not convictions. <laughs> okay. Those were sacks based, okay. based on, on allegations. The, and, on allegations. And then the, Courts. the, the persons mm. were taken to court, okay. and suddenly the case died down. No mm. conviction. They resigned or they were taken out of, of, office. of office, but no one except a certain person who went to jail for two years. Mm. And then afterwards, his conviction was overturned. overturned. All right, uh, we, we, could, we could spend the entire program talking about this, but thank you very much, Kende, for coming You're on welcome. the show. Kende Amodu is our State House Correspondent. We will take a short break now, and then uh, hindsight continues. Stay with us. On this program, we'll be bringing you news, views, and exclusive interviews with security that cut across humanitarian aid to it becomes easier to do business in Nigeria. Now, Nigeria. All right, let's turn our attention elsewhere because Sierra Leone might not be dominating world headlines at the moment, but it is a country still trying to come to terms with a devastating mudslide which killed over 400 people a few weeks ago. It was the worst natural disaster to hit the West African country. A period of mourning was declared days after the incident. Now, and of course, that has ended. But when I caught up with the High Commissioner of Sierra Leone to Nigeria less than 24 hours after disaster struck, I began by asking her what the mood in her country was. Here's what she told me. We are all very sad. Sierra Leone and the people of Sierra Leone, they are crying. Even some people don't even know what to eat, where to go, even the next Port of call because a whole family wiped out. Whole communities wiped out. Some people left for a job, you know those early morning jobs, just to be called because it happened around 2.30 on that 14th, 2.30 a.m. Whilst people were all asleep except those who go on morning jobs. You can imagine you are just called, coming back, your whole family. There were even areas where some people, they just moved after building. You say, okay, you, my wife and children, I'll be coming the next day until I finish this shop and close up this area. Next day, see what happened. The family gone. There's a sense that this is a rude awakening for your country, you know, uh, looking at the sort of buildings and people put up and where they put them up. Is there a sense that this is going to change? can want to because every country every system that should be what we call physical planning I didn't want to say it because maybe they will say because I served in the ministry you understand but there was what we called the green belt demarcation under my time I did that beyond which no development, because uh, we noticed, I served in the past government, so we noticed people were just building, even though some are strong houses, but they are not, because you, what you used to build the house, you use only for embankment first. It's a lot of money, you must have money to embank that kind of thing. But you can just imagine those who are up there with shanties, how easily to just erode. I even did the brown belt, we, as a government, the brown belt for the fossils, 
you know, so people don't build, you know, it's uh, long because the sand is sort of brown, you see, brown belt. And I passed, a shanty policy was passed in cabinet by then. Because the ministry we served by then, not now that you see Ministry of Lands. By then it was Ministry of Lands, Housing, Country Planning, and the Environment. I carried all that by then. And we did all of this. We relocated people. You know, you own the land. So you locate from bolder areas because it happened during that time. And it was an opportunity. It involves tough decisions, tough actions. I know what I went through in executing that program. But I wouldn't see it for the media. You know, you, you must, you know, step hard decisions. But that is development. Hard decisions must be taken to prevent another disaster. Haja Kaba, High Commissioner of Sierra Leone to Nigeria there. Now, the Chinese government has over the last decade or so become a major player in Africa. It has been partnering with countries like Nigeria as it seeks to address its infrastructure deficit. But, how, but now the federal government has indicated it will be seeking public-private partnerships with local and foreign companies uh, to address infrastructure problems. Minister of the FCT, Mohamed Bello, gave this indication during uh, the third china Nigeria consular forum held in Abuja. Speaking also, China's ambassador to Nigeria, Zhu Pingyan, said as China's third largest trading partner, Nigeria will continue to feature prominently in China's plan for Africa's development. Nigeria is China's largest project contracting market with eye-catching contracts worth billions of dollars. At the Forum for Africa-China Cooperation in 2015, China unveiled a $60 billion funding support for Africa. Some of that cash is being used for infrastructure projects in Nigeria, like the Abuja to Kaduna Rail Project, Abuja Metro Project, the Outer Southern Expressway, and the 700 megawatts in Gero Power Plant in Niger State. China says it remains committed to a win-win relationship. Lagos Ibada Railway, who started, we also started it this year, and to my knowledge, the ministers of finance and the minister of minister of transportation were in China last week to finalize the deal with China X Bank. The federal government is obviously appreciative of China's support and the concessionary loans it has brought to the table. The minister of the FCT, however, says it is time to move beyond these sort of loans to public-private partnerships. Very good loans with concessionary rates. But I think now, based on your experience of the last 10 years, and particularly the last two years, and based on the survey that shows the perception of Nigerians with the relationship with your country at over 80%, that shows you that this is the right time for companies from your country to come in here and invest more. China and Nigeria's cooperation goes beyond all of this. The foundation of this bilateral relationship is the people-to-people -people exchanges, and both countries have expressed their determination to deepen them. Now, Niger State is known as the power state, but the state that boasts three major power plants is said to become even more powerful. This is because a fourth hydropower plant being built by a Chinese company in Zugeru is said to deliver 700 megawatts of electricity to the national grid by 2020. I have been to Zungeru to see how the project is changing the lives of the people there. Nigeria is still grappling with crippling power shortages decades after independence. Africa's most populated country doesn't generate enough power for its people. But a plan has been afoot since 2013, which could go some distance in solving that problem. Enter Zungeru, a town in Niger state. Zungeru was the capital of the British Protectorate of Northern Nigeria from 1902 until 1916. Tom Kumadaki is the village head of Zungeru. He calls it the forgotten capital of northern Nigeria. We came at a time his palace was without electricity. Most of us cannot do without cool water. Most of us are used to sitting in air condition. Most of us are used to sitting in, fire, in, 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 in fan. Look at fan there. Since morning, see how you are, you are doing like this. Why? Because you know like... 
but the federal government in partnership with the Chinese firm is working to change the fortunes of not just this community, but the entire country. Zungeru now hosts a 700 megawatts power plant, which is in the making. It is costing almost $1.3 billion or 473 billion naira to build. Power will be evacuated from the transmission lines, high voltage transmission lines to the national grid managed by TCN. So one line is three, uh, 320 kV transmission line, another line is uh, 132 kV transmission lines. So actually the power generated from this project will be ben will benefiting the entire nation. This project is employing over 1,000 locals who will otherwise have been unemployed. Like the welders, the skill workers, generally they used to have trainees. And uh, after the trainees they used to issue certificates. Those certificates they are to serve as as an evidence of uh, a professional. They teach them how to drive, payloader, bulldozer. They are all there, tipper. They have, and they taught our children how to do all this work. We have been told the Chinese are bringing $984 million to the table for this project. Nigeria has paid its own part. The other aspect is uh, the Chinese government was supposed to also start implementing. As workers here continue digging and blasting their way through the rocks here, the expectation is that come 2020, this project, which has been signed off since 2013, will be fully delivered, lighting up the nation in the process. All right, let's bring you one last story on the program before we go, because uh, for 35 years, uh, Shola Enikonlaye served in Nigeria's Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It was a job that took him to quite a few countries, uh, serving in five missions. His final duty tour took him to India. He was in India when President Muhammadu Buhari uh, finally appointed him permanent secretary of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs uh, recently. A reception was held in Abuja in honor of Ambassador Enikon Lai. We end this program here this week with some nice words said to him and about him. I am Shegun Ujumu saying goodbye. All things come to an end sometimes. All things. So it's not really... Although it does seem sometimes that good things seem to come to an end faster than others. But all things come to an end, and we have to accept that. And so his tenure as permanent secretary um, has come to an end. But that's not the end of anything. In many ways, it's a new beginning. Trust me. <laughs> To be honest, I was so frightened when I retired from my last service at the United Nations. What am I going to do now? Amazon Nikolai, please note, from my experience, I'm busier now than when I was in the service. It's just that you have to define what you want to do and make it a passion. Make it a passion. And you also have an opportunity to choose whom you work to work with what you want to do rather than what you have to do. But there's really life after retirement. And it could be even richer in many ways um, than even when one is uh, in service. But let me warn you, precisely because you are retired, all kinds of people give you all kinds of things to do. Because they say, well, give him, he's, he's retired. So it's really up to you to really pick and choose and really do things that will give you the greatest happiness. Nigeria has a role to play. And we are destined to play that role. We are not like any other country in Africa. We have a leadership responsibility within our sovereignty, within our continent, and within our world. Your services, your ideas, your views, your experience, very much needed now as it has always been. The second level of gratitude goes to His Excellency, President Muhammad Buhari, GCFR, who appointed me Permanent Secretary and deployed me to the Minister of Foreign Affairs. 
It is one thing to be appointed afresh. It is yet another to be sent to a ministry of such strategic importance on first appointment. As my friend recalled, I have attempted to be BAMSEC on two previous occasions. I was not appointed. Even at the second attempt, I had begun to receive congratulatory messages. People are already lodging expectations and requests ever before that announcement was made. I was to represent Kogi State. That never happened. It took the miracle and intervention of God six years later for this to happen. At the most unexpected and most challenging period of my career, when I was serving in India. Again, that's another chapter in my memoir. On this occasion last year, when I had just one year to bow out from the service, Mr. President had earlier approved an attorney procedure for appointing family secretary without exams and interviews. After the group of 18 that was appointed in 2015, including one other, I was the only one appointed last year. I must therefore thank all those that the Almighty God used to make this happen, especially those who nominated me and those who were consulted, who, as the Foreign Minister revealed, came to the same conclusion that I should be so considered. 